Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, April 21st, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, new insight into Saudi Arabia and 9-11. Then, how doing well in school is a new form of oppression. After that, Senor Thor, a real-life Avenger, fights crime in Mexico. And another sports commentator gets benched for conservative views. That's next. This is you go to, say, 24-hour fitness in Houston or the YMCA, whatever it is, and you walk into the women's restroom and you go in the showers by women with your pants off. Used to that was called basically sexual assault, the beginning of sexual assault. Not now. Well, some more news coming at you by way of the United States of Orwell. The Guardian is now saying correcting people's bad grammar is racist. That's right. This is the Guardian's Mona Chalabi. And you know what? I might not even be pronouncing her name right, but that doesn't matter, according to her. She says correcting bad grammar is offensive and racist because white people are more likely to be concerned about good grammar. This is. She is the newspaper's data editor, okay? And she's talking about how grammar rules were invented by wealthy white people and therefore non-whites should be free to ignore them without being criticized. She, uh, Shalabi says, the people pointing out the mistakes are more likely to be older, wealthier, whiter, or just plain academic than the people they're treating with condescension. And all too often, it's a way to silence people. And that's particularly offensive when it's someone who might already be struggling to speak up. So rather than correct people's bad grammar, people should just shut up and listen to them. So, of course, like I said, this is the data editor. So who knows what kind of um, grammar faux pas are going to be coming out of The Guardian here soon. But the message is very clear. It's don't strive to improve yourself, accept mediocrity. This is, of course, completely demented. And this is... Another article coming out of the 17th Annual White Privilege Conference. So this is going to be taught at a university near you soon because this is a professional education consultant and teacher trainer who was arguing at the White Privilege Conference um, that just took place that great teachers must also be liberal activists. And she then described in great detail her goal for destroying the white supremacist nature of modern education. And here's what she says is white supremacy. Rugged individual, individualism, honest, hardworking, disciplined, rigorous, successful. This is the racial narrative of white. And so then the narrative of U.S. public education kind of falls in line with that individual assessment, meaning, you know, getting good grades, showing up on time, uh, using proper English, uh, discipline. This is all white supremacy. So, I mean, these might be regarded as, you know, traits necessary for success in the modern world, but she says that only white people are apparently capable of being on time, getting good grades, being disciplined. I think that is freaking racist. So basically you're saying that people of color do not possess these qualities. That is an absolutely racist notion. It's just like people who say, oh, well, you don't know what it's like to be black if you don't grow up in the hood, meaning people like Ben Carson can't be very successful multimillionaire neurosurgeons because you know what, you know, he, he doesn't know what it's like to be black. That is freaking racist and people need to stop with this. It's putting people in these little categories and trying to say everyone's equal, but yet boxing everyone in. It doesn't even make any sense to me and it's so frustrating. And that's why we point this stuff out because it is idiocracy, which by the way is celebrating its 10 year anniversary. Now here's an article that I thought was pretty interesting coming out of courts. There is a clever algorithm that's going to be generating millions of random ideas, and it's turning the table on patent trolls. Now, patent trolls, they'll basically just create some design, and it's very generalized. And that way, when someone comes along who actually wants to invent something, they will be forced to have to pay for these patent trolls. So this is an artist and engineer, Alexander Rebin. He's written an al uh, algorithm that exploits this convoluted U.S. patent system in order to mess with these patent trolls, and it's called All Prior Art. And so what it does is algorithm posts ideas for inventions that'll prevent people from filing patents that they're not going to use. 
according to U.S. patent law, if there's prior art, uh, in this case, anything that's previously published version of the idea, no one can file a patent on it. And he's posted 4.2 million such ideas and counting. So this is really good because we have people out there that are just filing these arbitrary patents and then blackmailing and exploiting the actual creators of this world who would do something positive uh, with whatever it is they want to come along and invent. And I know someone who is very uh, intensely protective of intellectual property rights, Prince, okay? Now Prince, of course, he's very well known for all of his contract fights, copyright battles. Of course, he even changed his name to get back control of his music. Um, he actually filed a patent for the Purple Axe, which is the custom designed guitar, the keyboard and guitar that he used. Uh, that famous there was kind of in there with his sim symbol when he was the artist formerly known as. Well, Prince died today at the age of 57. Uh, right now, it's kind of unknown, but people said that he had been battling with the flu. And so he collapsed, and they did fa find him in an elevator at Paisley Park at 10.07 a.m. Central Time. Now, Kit Daniels has an article up. Many conspiracy theories are already floating around about what could have caused the death of Prince. Uh, but our article is up. Did the chemtrail flu kill Prince as well as Merle Haggard? Both of them suddenly died of a mysterious illness, and they both had been suffering with the flu. Now, just like Merle Haggard, Prince also spoke out about chemtrails. He even wrote a song about it. Tell me about Dreamer. When I was a kid, I used to see these trails in the sky all the time, and a jet just went over. And then you started to see a whole bunch of them. And the next thing you know, everybody in your neighborhood was fighting and arguing, and you didn't know why. Okay? And... And you really didn't know why. I mean, everybody was fighting. The first line of the song says, I was born uh, on the same plantation in the United States of the red, white, and blue. Joining me now is Kit Daniels to talk about this flu-like sickness that is causing a surge of respiratory illnesses across the country, um, as well as we're going to talk about some of the contributions Prince made to society. Yeah, Leanne, just look at some of these headlines from the past couple of months. Eight-year-old girl dies suddenly of flu complications this February 19th. She said this little girl woke up Sunday morning with a stomach bug. Family friends told her she tested positive for influenza when they took her to the hospital. But that afternoon, within just a few hours, they were performing CPR on her and she was gone. Same thing happened with this, uh, this school teacher, I believe, in Kentucky. Uh, she was, had trouble breathing, and before they know it, within 24 hours, she was also gone. Mm. And then, uh, see, Sun City Independent, at midseason, cases are up 50% compared to all flu, last season's flu season. He was, uh, uh, this uh, gentleman was diagnosed with acute respiratory failure, just like Merle Haggard, and spent four days in the hospital. And uh, the uh, doctors wouldn't release him until his blood uh, oxygen level was up to at least 93%. He was only at 84 so yeah, I mean, we always have flu seasons every year, but this is unprecedented in the fact that now we have all of a sudden this huge spike and not only the uh, prevalence of flu, but the, its severity as well. Well, it's also a, a mystery flu that they're not able to diagnose right away. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, that's the thing what I wrote about today about the chemtrail flu. It's like all of a sudden we just, you see all these chemtrails being sprayed everywhere. Mm -hmm. You have all these uh, contrails that just last for hours up in the sky. And then all of a sudden you see all this, these, this widespread flu pa pandemic going around the country. And it's like, what's really going on here? Right. I mean, it's maybe it's not chemtrails, but it's at least worth posing the question. But what really strikes me about, about his medical emergency was it was just like these other two cases, these three cases I just talked about. It was all of a sudden and they rushed him to the hospital and then he seemed fine for a while, but then they find him dead in an elevator. Right. It was just like these flu cases. You just you have this sudden surge in these flu-like symptoms, and all before you know it, the victim's gone. Mm -hmm. So what's really going on here? I mean, it's worth at least investigating, trying to find out what's really going on, we, like we had with the Flint water crisis. I mean, I'm sure like a couple of years ago, people would have been, if you posed the question, maybe the government's doing something with the water supply they're not supposed to be doing, or there's incompetence. You know, they'd laugh at you as a conspiracy theorist. So it's like this weird thing where it's, you're not allowed to pose questions, even though the questions you pose might lead to the actual answer. Right. Yeah. And don't worry about what you can actually see with your eyes, which, mm -hmm. of course, is what Prince was talking about in the clip we just 
played is that he could see them with his own eyes and then he would see the actual effects yeah. that it was having on the people in his neighborhood. So yeah. very interesting there. Yeah, and moving on to Drudge, uh, Prince's, the contributions he made in his life, you know, I read some headlines on Drudge this afternoon. And one of the things that really struck out with me the most about Prince was he, he spent his whole life fighting for control over his music. Now, some of his techniques weren't really stuff I agree with. You know, he was trying to push copyright claims on YouTube. At one point, he's put a copyright claim on a mother because she used like a 29 second clip of his song while his baby was like dancing to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's still, uh, it's been like 10 years ago, it's still circulating. In well, they actually just decided um, earlier this year or late last year that yeah. finally it took about 10 years. To so yeah, it's easy to kind of see Prince as this abuser in the situation, but once you look a little bit more deeper into it, you see that this is a man who's always been trying to fight control for his music, not just by people bootlegging his music, but also by the music industry executives and the record companies and whatnot. Um, he said in this tweet once that if you uh, don't own your masters, meaning your master tapes, then the masters own you. Right. And he also mentioned this in a uh, interview, that late night interview that he, a couple of years back, that he said he was talking about control over your creation, about how you need to, if you create something, you really need to have control over it. And, you know, we, he talked, one thing he really brought out in the interview that really resonated with me was the fact that he said that we need to have this discussion now before we start talking about God and like the DNA. Because now what we see is these companies, they're trying to patent the human. Uh, right. He talked about they're going to want to yeah. patent your DNA. Yeah, And exactly. you've got to own yourself. Yeah. Right. So it's like what really struck out to me was his argument about controlling his master tapes it leads into what we see now with the TPP and all these other uh, multinational corporations trying to use copyright to control you and your life work. Right. Absolutely. Well, and that's something that we're definitely going to start seeing as well is they're using your DNA to patent certain cancer treatments and things like that. So they are. And, mm -hmm. and there again, that was Prince way before his time. They're warning everyone about ownership. Well, thank you very much, Kit. I yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Well, here's the main argument for just why a border wall will not work. Yeah, you might stop some people from coming in or out, but you're not going to stop the cartel from digging tunnels. Now, federal agents have seized a ton of cocaine and seven tons of marijuana. It was smuggled through a secret tunnel stretching a half mile beneath the U.S.-Mexico border. It's the longest one yet unearthed in California. It's 870 yards long. It, the northern end uh, emerges in a narrow industrial expanse. Um, it's excavated 46 feet beneath the surface of the earth. It ran from the bottom of an elevator shaft that was built into a house in Tijuana all the way to a hole in the ground on the U.S. side that was enclosed with a fenced-in lot set up as a pallet business. The hole was concealed under a trailer-sized trash dumpster. And so what the smugglers would do is they put the trash in the dumpster and then haul the dumpster to another location. So the wall is not going to work. But now we have... Someone coming up with a different way of dealing with the narcos. This is a hero Mexican Marine. He's hunting down drug cartels and uh, humiliating them. When you talk about violence in Mexico, you often think of names like El Chapo, places like Sinaloa, but now there are new areas and players involved. And the person I'm going to be talking about today is not even a drug cartel kingpin at all. He is a vigilante out there combating the cartels. He goes by the name of Senor Thor. And when he catches his prey, he makes them dress in women's clothing to dehumanize them, demoralize them. In some cases, he makes them engage with one another. During one raid, he stole the ashes of a feared drug lord's deceased father. That's pretty uh, gutsy. His nemesis, known as El Chive, responded by accusing him of corruption, which I think is rather laughable for a drug kingpin to accuse anybody of corruption. But I guess his, that's his story, and he's sticking to it. They're saying that uh, El Thor is allegedly stealing money from the cartels, but I'm saying you, if you steal money from a thief, is it really stealing in the first place? But I guess everybody has their own moral sanctions to go by. And they're saying that Senior Thor is a former Marine, retired Marine, who's in Mexico trying to clean up the streets because he sees the problems that are lying in law enforcement, and I am sure there are good people in law enforcement out there who want to get rid of the cartels, but you have more than a few who are actually working for the cartel, so he's just cutting through the middleman and going after the guys himself. Uh, very similar, similar to a character like the Punisher, 
in my point of view. And he's been pretty effective. He's uh, knocked down some big hitters out there, but he still has a lot more to go. And uh, one of the groups that he's affecting is Los Zetas. And if you guys recall, we've been talking about Los Zetas for some time. I actually have an article here, Paul Joseph Watson dated back in 2011, when we saw that a Los Zetas kingpin was saying that they bought guns directly from the United States government. Now, I'm sure many people will, will dismiss this. They say, well, he's a kingpin. We can't trust anything he says. Well, we do know the ATF did give guns to Mexican drug cartels. So uh, at least hear what the guy has to say. Now, whether or not it was directly related to Operation Fast and Furious, I can believe that they were sold weapons by the United States government because you think about uh, the Iran-Contra scandal, selling guns to people overseas, and on and on and on. Selling guns to our enemies or just bad people in general is not something new for the United States government. They do it all the time. They've done it throughout history. Multiple presidents, uh, administrations, uh, right, left, whatever, they go about this. And this reminds me of films like Sicario, documentaries like Cartel Land, where the people in Mexico actually take it upon themselves to fight back, and some people say they're vigilantes, they're dangerous. Uh, regardless, even if that is true, you have to take into account the fact that what's being done in Mexico is not doing enough to stop the problem there. You see routinely, just like you saw in the movie Sicario, uh, they were killing people, hanging them from the rafters under bridges. They do that in real life. Oftentimes, those victims are journalists. We've seen uh, multiple reports about good politicians who want to root out the cartels, ending up dead, people on payrolls, as I already mentioned. So it is a very big and steady problem out there. So something has to be done. Good, bad, or indifferent, he is making enough change to get his name out there. So Senior Thor, uh, we'll see how you continue and possibly you'll have a long career. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. Well, Trump might have stepped in it today after he said that transgender people like Caitlyn Jenner can use whatever bathroom they want at Trump Tower. This was during NBC's Today Show. Uh, Trump came out against the North Carolina bathroom bill uh, that required people to use the biologically correct bathroom. And he noted that the state has faced a lot of strife and economic punishment as a result of the law. Trump basically said that people he's spoken to says, you know, they've had very few problems. Leave it the way it is. They're paying a big price, and there's a lot of problems economically with what's going on. But Trump, you've completely missed the point. North Carolina was fighting back against a federal mandate. Okay, it's a very small percentage of the population, and now there is a totalitarian move by the federal government to police people and especially private businesses. Now here in D.C., uh, they want residents there to report private businesses over gender, the gender-neutral bathroom law. Uh, they say, if you see a public bathroom with one stall that is not gender neutral, just tweet us the business name and location using Safe Bathrooms DC or fill out our five question form. And they say they want to make it a more enjoyable place for transgender and other communities. But like I said, it's 0.3% of the population, but the majority of people are now being policed and forced to have to accommodate to a relatively new thing without probably, you know, proper education on the whole thing. And a lot of people are speaking out about it to their detriment, much like ESPN's Kurt Schilling. He's been fired for daring to comment on a Facebook meme. He shared this meme on his Facebook page. Uh, they're kind of clearly showing that he was against transgender individuals using bathrooms against their biological sex. ESPN said he's been terminated. His conduct was unacceptable. Um, you know, so there's a no tolerance, zero tolerance for the majority of people in this country who do not identify as transgender, which is 0.3 percent of the population. So for you, there are detrimental uh, consequences for daring to voice your opinion about this very controversial topic. Now, just to show you how bizarre it's gotten on the left with these liberal students, they've been so indoctrinated, so tra trained there was a, a viral video that was posted to YouTube last week where a, a man, a white man, went to college campuses and interviewing people saying, you know what, listen, I identify as a seven-year-old Chinese female. Is that okay? And all but one person said stuff like, you know, I feel like it's not my place as another human to say if someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. And another girl was like, good for you, girl. I don't have a problem with it. So... 
you know, it's like, it's great. It's so, I'm all inclusive. Every, I'm, everyone's equal. But you're not taking into consideration women who have uh, been victims of sexual assault, parents who might not want their young children to see a penis in the dressing room um, and then have to go through that whole conversation with, you know, why does this woman have a penis or something as these are your young kids. There is a, just a whole plethora of ideas behind this that need to be talked about before you start federally mandating and policing people to just accept this no matter what. And that is the problem. That is the big issue that people have with this. Now, there's a great article up on The Federalist. It's called Drop the T from LGBT. And the author, Walt Heyer, makes the argument that it's time for the LGBT community to part ways with the trans movement, uh, basically saying that there's going to be some backlash against the, the gay and bisexual lesbian community if something does happen with this transgender bathroom bill. Uh, he says, you know, most gay men don't care whether transgenders can get access to the public restrooms of the opposite sex but they are going to care when pedophiles and deviants invoke such laws to indulge their sexual perversions in public restrooms, because that is going to bring a backlash against their community. And he also points out how a lot of transgender people are actually dealing with mental, uh, mental disorders, as well as psychological issues, which are the root of the problem that need to be addressed first before you immediately tell them that they should just fix their problems with gender reassignment surgery. And the author would know because he himself went to a gender uh, psychologist one time who suggested he get this surgery, and he did. And that did not solve any of his problems, living as a woman for about seven years. And he's actually now gone back to living as a man. Of course, it's too late after he'd gone through the surgery, and now he's made a whole movement of trying to rescue people from this thing where psychologists would diagnose you with a different type of disorder. We're actually going to get Walt on the show to break down his story. But of course, Target and other places are jumping on the bandwagon, opening up the dressing rooms now to whomever would want to come in. Joe Biggs has more. This is Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. Now we're standing outside of a Target location in Austin, Texas. Now yesterday, Target's corporate website released a statement saying that they want to welcome transgendered people, men, women who identify as a separate gender, a different gender, to be able to use those restrooms and changing rooms. So we came out here today to find out if people think that there's a issue with that or if they're completely fine with it. Because we do know that there are perverts, there are pedophiles who will take advantage of this and try to do harm to others. Let's go out here and find out what these people have to say. I don't know. I guess it's kind of a safety issue when it comes to kids, right? Oh, that's... Wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> wow. The no was a policy. Yep, it just came out yesterday at their Target corporate website. I mean, I'm all for everybody being who they are, and that's fine, but I don't think it's a good idea. No, that's, that's crazy. I mean... That doesn't make any sense. Wait, say, say that again? I mean, yeah. it, it, it seems so illogical. I support, trans, I support Target and their policy. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I mean, do you think anything could possibly go wrong with it, or do you think it's fine that men can go in the women's restroom? I haven't thought about it. No issue? No, no comment idea? Yeah. I, I have no problem with that at all. No? No. No problems. Let's see. Check the calendar. Check the calendar. It's 2016. It's time for a change. I, um... I have a mommy and daddy, an adopted mommy and daddy, who are totally comfortable with me being a little girl. You know, when you see a guy that's 300 pounds with a goatee who pulls in in a Harley and uh, is going through my closet and saying, can I wear this dress? Can I wear that dress? You know, or can I kiss you when I'm wearing the dress? You don't expect it. Um, well, I have some friends and people that I know that would probably identify that way, so I'm okay with whatever suits their needs. I don't know, and I'm a pretty liberal old lady. I'm just not real sure that I want men in the dressing in my bathroom space. But on the other hand, I think if you have uh, gender ad identification other than what you were born, you have rights too. So it's a t it's a tough way to call it. I think they're perverted, and they ought to go to hell. Yeah. Yeah. All targets across the the country. I'm curious. I'm gonna go ask them. Yeah, Thank go you. ask them. It's on the corporate website too. Yep. If you go to the uh, corporate website, they updated it yesterday that allows transgendered or any kind of man who says I identify as a woman. So me right now, a 250 pound guy could walk in there and go, I'm a woman and just go use the restroom. I want to 
to ask about that. I'll be back. Thanks. All right. <laughs> I mean, what do you think could go wrong? Like a pedophile, someone trying to misuse that to come in there and do something? It's a lot of crazy people in this world. Yeah. Uh, who knows? I just don't think it's a good idea, especially if you have young children going to the bathroom with, you know, that. So, no, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't like that at all. Why? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? What don't, what, what don't you like about that? What, men going in the women's room? Uh, I just believe they should be separate. Well, lots of things. You just said it. It could be a pedophile who just walks in and just uses that loophole to actually yeah. probably hurt someone. That's the bathroom. first time yeah. I've heard of that. It's transgender people are the, are are what the concern is. They're not pedophiles. They're just people. Well, no, no. We're not concerned about transgender because we know there's normal people out there, but there's still bad people in this world that could use that loophole. I don't find that as a loophole. I have two daughters. I don't think so. And you're fine with them going in? I don't trust anyone else to protect my child like I will, so... Even nowadays, if I don't feel comfortable going into the public restroom, I just go into their family restroom with my kid. That's what I do. I think trans people are just trying to use a restroom, and that's all they're doing. So I'm glad that Target's uh, allowing that, that to happen. If it were that safe, I would say sure, but the world's not that safe. Uh, my sister had somebody use, their, use a camera to look up her skirt inside the store, so now they're in restrooms too. Like, And not saying that who, or, I mean, that person was probably a gender straight person, you know, normally sociable, yeah. you know, identifiable, but people still, it's, that's somewhere supposed to be safe. Well, just hypothetically, what do you think about that? No, I wouldn't agree with it. I don't want, I don't want men in the women's restroom. Because nothing could possibly ever go wrong with that, right? Correct, right, yeah. exactly. Right. So, I think that's Well, at least good. you're more concerned about it and you're willing to go in there and get the number and make a call and find out. I'd like to know, you guys have at least brought it up and I'm curious to know if that's their policy or not. Then I can make my decision on whether I'm comfortable using the restroom in the Target store. Roger Stone joins us now. Roger, you're, you're in New York, you're in Florida, you're in California, you're, you're all over the place. Where are you today? I know you were in New York the last few days in those big important uh, powwows. So let's talk about the new order uh, of the tr Trump campaign uh, that I know you don't like to brag, but that you've been seminal in, in uh, working towards. And then we're going to get into uh, moving forward, uh, the big rally that you and others are organizing for uh, the integrity of the popular vote uh, and so much more. Well, Alex, I'm actually in Florida today where the Republican National Committee is meeting in Hollywood, Florida for three days as the run up to the Republican National Convention. Uh, it, I am very, very excited about the uh, big win in New York. I think it was a manifestation of the uh, new focus of the Trump campaign. Uh, but let me be really clear, the changes made to Donald Trump's campaign were made by Donald Trump. He's the big picture man, and, and I am merely a supporter, as uh, is Paul Manafort, his, his new convention director, and essentially the guy uh, guiding the campaign towards the magic number of 1,237. Uh, this was a big victory in New York, uh, and I think it, it shows uh, a new technology on the part of the Trump people. I think they very skillfully overlaid Donald Trump's very effective public appearances and rallies um, with those congressional districts that were most competitive, uh, and they emerged not only with a sweep, but with tricky Ted Cruz running a really poor, and I would argue embarrassing, third. So um, uh, it is interesting to me that as we go forward, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, uh, I see these as Trump country. These are places where both public and private polls show Donald Trump with strong leads. Uh, and Ted Cruz is now reduced to bragging about South Dakota in Montana. Uh, and while those are wonderful states, they're small states in the far west uh, where I frankly think uh, Trump is still competitive. So I don't see uh, Ted Cruz being competitive in any of the states moving forward. Uh, California, of course, is the big enchilada. Now, in all honesty, I can tell you as uh, someone who's experienced in nine Republican presidential campaigns, California is too big to organize on a grassroots basis. I love grassroots activity. I'm obviously for it, but I view it as gravy. This is the ultimate media state, and it's a state where celebrity has great importance. 
Donald Trump is, of course, the ultimate celebrity. He has a star quality that no other candidate can match. Um, his campaigning, as I think you have seen, Alex, has become more focused and more uh, effective in just days since a leadership change in his campaign. So I am more bullish than ever before that he will get 1,237 votes on the first ballot. And before I stop and let you ask a question, let me say I'm also more bullish that we can shed enough light on the corrupted system to stop the steal that the party regulars have in mind in the event that Donald Trump does get 1,237 delegates. Now, Roger Stone again joining us via video Skype from Florida, crisscrossing the country. He's been I'm up trying, there. but I'm dealing with a uh, iPad. Sure, we're 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 working on some of his uh, on some of his Skype real quick. So um, taking care of that, we're going to go right back to him here in just a moment. Uh, now going back to Roger Stone. Roger, let me ask you this question. Obviously, you want to talk about Donald Trump. You want to talk about winning. You want to talk about the campaign. But so much of it is about the campaign, and people want to know now that there has been a lot of leadership change. Uh, you know, you're a team player. But just to let us know why that leadership is so good, uh, your business partner and others basically more and more heading up the campaign. What is the real structure of the campaign? I mean, isn't it just Trump and then he has a group of advisors he talks to and whoever really is the head is the person that he actually listens to the most? Because I am seeing a lot more sophistication come in. That's question number one, uh, Roger. Then number two, and this is obviously even more important, uh, is the Republican Party really warming to him, or do they realize that it's backfiring on them stealing these primaries, and so they're going to play possum until they get to Cleveland? Well, let me say a couple things. First of all, uh, unlike these career politicians that we're so used to, Donald Trump runs Donald Trump's campaign. So, Steve, I don't normally do a 10-minute intro to you, but, I, I, I mean, this is a big time. I mean, this is this is huge when mainstream newspapers have the headline, how the U.S. government covered up the Saudi Arabian role. We know the, the 28 pages show the stand down in the congressional report, and we know the military knows what really went on. And I know you've talked on air, and I think it's been lost because you're dropping such bombshells about CFR meetings you've been in, meetings with generals, where it just gets right down to everybody knows it's inside job and everybody knows who did it. And there's discussions about what went on. And some people say, well, we did it, you know, to expose the radical Muslim threat. Oh, really? So you could double cross us and then bring them in and overtake Europe with them? I mean, this is, this is so sophisticated what they've done. And hopefully as a top spy master, uh, you know, one of the most famous out there, not known, you know, in, in your real person, but best known in movies and the rest of it. Have I accurately crystallized this? And have we reached a point where it's a lot safer for people like you and I that helped punch the detonator that is now, many years later, uh, brought down the 9-11 fraud. And what does that domino falling? Because even if the Saudis are successful blocking the release, they've convicted themselves. That's even better. <laughs> uh, Dr. Pachinik. Well, it's been a great honor and a pleasure, but the truth of the matter is we do owe it to you, Alex, and I certainly owe it to the American public that's been listening to the alternative media since, you know, God knows when, 2001, and, and you've, you all have done a phenomenal job. It's not about me and it's not about Alex. It's about a lot more people, and, and believe it or not, it's the people within the intelligence community and the military. I can't tell you how many times I'm stopped by individuals who recognize my voice, not necessarily my name, who, who work within the system and are grateful for what we have done because the civilians who were involved, Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Steve Hadley, Hillary Clinton, the Wolfowitzes, the neocons, the neocon Jews, Israel, Dubai, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, will all be implicated in what's happened in 9-11. But what eventually arose from all of this were several factors. One, was the emergence of a very unique individual who no, no one could have predicted. I did not predict that a Trump would arise at a moment when our history required a self-made American entrepreneur, 
an American-made entrepreneur, not somebody who depended on the kindness of strangers, but somebody who was able to take whatever assets he had and build it into a fortune, which he then dedicated to creating something better for others, namely America. He doesn't need the power. He doesn't need the money. He doesn't need the accolades of any of these Republicans. That's why we are now in the crux of the revolution, as Alex has said. You have all deserved this moment, but we can't stop because the Republican Party has now become the face of the enemy. The Priebuses, the Mitt Romneys, the Jeb Bushes, the Neil Bushes, the Marvin Bushes, the, the Paul Singers, the uh, Ricketts family, the Hubbard family, all those families who never served our country, but who were able to take and extract our slave labor and our monies in order to aggrandize their fortunes. Now, the irony is many of these com uh, companies, particularly the Koch brothers, his father made his fortune, not in America, but under Stalin. So I usually call the Koch brothers, who graduated where I did at MIT, the Red Babies, because the real fortunes were not made in the American oil fields. They were made under Stalin in the Soviet oil fields, and they're ashamed to talk about that because they're the diaper babies. Unlike us right now, we're in the midst of a revolution where Trump is the spear and the cutting edge to cut into what's called the rules of the party. The rules of the Republican Party are no more rules than fictitious rules that we have in any other institution of fascism. I saw those rules in the Soviet Union, and the more rules they imposed on me when I worked in the Soviet Union, the easier it was for me and others in the intelligence community to take the Soviet Union apart. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Oh, well, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. Take me in, oh, tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, oh, tender woman. Sighed the vicious snake. Take me in, oh, tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, oh, tender woman. Sighed the vicious snake. Now she clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in, by now, you might have died. She stroked his pretty skin, and then she kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, that snake gave her a vicious bite. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bit me, heavens why. You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. They're intentionally leaving the borders open in Europe, bringing in mass refugees. Among them are going to be jihadists who are setting up a, a future Tet offensive, Tet style offensive in Europe. And the same thing's being done to this country. David Deleden, founder of the Center for Medical Progress and the man sued by Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Federation argued early on, every taping we did during this project was done in full compliance with local recording laws. Meanwhile, several social media posts detail an apparent pro-abortion rally at the University of North Georgia held last week at which cookies in the shape of babies were reportedly eaten and had their heads broken off. The pro-abortion folks were eating the baby cookies or breaking the heads off and laughing. The College Fix reports. Yet, even as freedom of the press was scrutinized by the leftist establishment agenda and Planned Parenthood protected, a bipartisan battle ensued on Capitol Hill over the validity and legality of newly revealed documents that provided legitimacy to Deleden's findings. Founded on the basis of highly deceptive edited videos, these videos have since been proven to be misleading and false by multiple independent investigations across the country. 
questions of profit and legality matter because we're talking about people. It matters whether or not procurement businesses broke the law. It matters whether or not abortion clinics are lining their pockets through the dismemberment and distribution of children, all while receiving tax dollars. As seen on exhibit B2 and B3, the procurement business markets itself on its brochure as a way for clinics to make additional income by allowing the procurement business, procurement technicians, to take fetal tissues and organs from aborted babies immediately after the abortion was completed, using the words financially profitable, fiscally rewards, financial benefit on its brochure. The select panel investigation reveals that every conceivable harvesting task is performed by the technician employed by the procurement business. And so procurement businesses, essentially the middleman, are paying fees to abortion clinics, but the abortion clinics are incurring no cost. Exhibit D shows payments from the procurement business to abortion clinics for aborted babies and baby blood. Exhibit D1. The abortion clinic charged the middleman with a bill for $11,365 in August of 2010 for baby parts and blood that the middleman's technicians harvested. Another invoice in January, February of 2011 charged $9,060 for harvested baby parts and blood. The middleman even makes it easy for the researcher to purchase baby body parts. Exhibit C3, the procurement business order form or, or the drop down menu for baby organs shows just how easy this is. First, it asks on, on the left side, quote, what type of tissue would you like to order? And I suppose you could respond uh, anyone could respond to this. Um, I would like to order brain. And then it says number of specimens. Well, six, let's say, baby brains. Gestational range, start and end. Well, uh, be 16 to 18 weeks. And then here's another question. Add another tissue type? You could say yes. Uh, another tissue type listed, female repu re reproductive system and ovaries. Uh, you could say I take five of those uh, at 15 weeks. Uh, you could add, you know, send uh, five baby tongues. Shipping or options. Um, you could respond, yes, I want it rush ordered. So for crying out loud, this is the Amazon.com of baby body parts. There is a market for baby body parts and you get what you pay for. This is absolutely repulsive. And we must not forget it as was testified here. Each one of these, you know, little baby brains or tongues represent a baby. How can anyone defend this practice? Uh, what this committee is about is highly important and very critical to the criminal justice system and to the uh, sanctity of that system in the United States of America. It's really not uh, about uh, the issue of abortion because pro uh, potential profiteering and trafficking in aborted uh, fetal tissue is of grave concern, not only on the federal level, but also in many states, including my own state of Colorado, uh, which has uh, adopted a law similar to the federal law that is being uh, looked at uh, by this committee today. There are many, many people, therefore, concerned that not only this federal statute but also the, the state statutes at issue have been violated and are being flouted by the abortion industry. We can all agree on this statute. It passed with bipartisan support in a Democratic Congress and was signed into law by President Clinton. Representative Waxman at the time called the fetal corpse market abhorrent. And yet, the panel's evidence reveals that abortion clinics are being promised a profit and, and are paid even when they have no apparent costs to be reimbursed, and further multiplying a clinic's windfall via savings on disposal services. 
Tissue procurement companies are likewise paid exorbitantly by their customers. This market in baby organs and tissues demonstrates a flagrant and repeated disregard for the rule of law. And um, we actually see there on the first line where she communicates with the assistant manager says, upon arrival, inform the staff clearly of what you are procuring for the day. So let's follow on then with um, exhibit C5. The procurement tech then reviews the medical files, which is another subject of whether this is a HIPAA violation, whether she has um, the rights to be looking at those files of so the patients to learn their names and the gestation time of their baby. And she records this in a gestation tracking log, um, essentially matching the patient with her needs, not the patient's needs, but with her needs of what she's been given as her job for the day. Um, also, it was stated that researchers are losing money on this fetal tissue. If they're losing money, how, how are they losing money if there's not a financial transaction? Clearly, there are more questions and falsehoods surrounding the fetal tissue scandal, but it isn't Planned Parenthood's feet being held over the fire. Here in liberal bizarro land, an attack on the First Amendment is well underway. Leftist propaganda fueled drivel pushers like MSNBC and Salon, for instance, continue to argue that David DeLeden isn't a journalist and deserves no quarter for his actions to uncover the truth behind the sacred walls of the Rockefeller supported African American decimating Planned Parenthood. Dinosaur Media is completely steering the boat in another direction veering the public conversation as far away from the highly questionable practices of the sale and distribution of America's children. John Bound for Infowars.com.